Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending upon where you are in the world, and welcome to today's DevOps.com webinar. I'm Charlene O'Hanlon, moderator for today's event, and I welcome you. As always, we have a great webinar on tap, but before we get started, we do have a few housekeeping items we need to go over. First of all, today's event is being recorded, so if you miss any or all of the event, you will have the opportunity to access it later on. Following today's webinar, we will be sending out an email that contains a link to access the webinar on demand. And we are taking questions from the audience. So if at any time during today's presentation, you have a question for either of our speakers, please don't wait, don't hesitate. Just use your GoToWebinar control panel and submit your questions. And we'll try to get to as many as we can near the end of today's webinar. Also happening at the end of today's webinar is a drawing for six $25 Amazon gift cards. So please stick around. Hopefully you'll be one of our six lucky winners. All right, with that, we'll go ahead and kick off today's webinar, which is diving into the deep and dark web or the evil internet, vulnerability prioritization through the eyes of hackers. Our speakers today are David Habusha, who is the VP of product at WhiteSource, and Paolo Shikarian, who is the CEO of Cyber Reconnaissance Inc., also known as CyberCon. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you so much for joining me today. Really appreciate it. Happy to be here. Thank you. Shirley. Excellent, excellent. Thank you. David, I know you are going to be kicking off the conversation, so I'm going to put myself on mute, take myself off camera, and let you guys get right to it. Thank you. Okay, so uh, let's get started then. So, uh, what are we going to discuss today? Uh, first of all, is uh, why do we actually need to prioritize handling security vulnerabilities? Um, if we have a risk in our applications, uh, why don't we just resolve all vulnerabilities? I mean, if you have a bug in your system or your code, you would probably want to uh, look at all of those bugs and uh, resolve them. So we'll look into uh, various ways of uh, handling vulnerability prioritization, um, what are the most common practices to do that? Uh, we'll give you some use cases of actual customers who deal with thousands and uh, tens of thousands of different vulnerabilities and what do they do and, and the approaches that they've embraced to uh, prioritize those vulnerabilities. And then uh, we'll kind of summarize it with uh, what are the uh, two best approaches uh, following the uh, the content that we're going to share on this presentation. So this is the agenda for the day. And again, thanks for joining. Um, so the first thing that, uh, that we need to understand is that development time is expensive. Uh, we'd like our developers to focus on creating business value for our organizations. Uh, sometimes they see handling security vulnerabilities is something they would not necessarily want to prioritize in general. So if we want to uh, have a good cooperation from the development team, if we want to reduce the friction, we'll have to find ways to actually prioritize the vulnerabilities to the ones that really matter, to the ones that really impact our applications, the ones that actually um, constitute a risk to our business. And we'd like to keep that to the minimum. So we allow our developers to actually handle a small number of uh, those vulnerabilities and focus on bringing real business value to our companies. Uh, from a survey that we've um, done last year, we discovered that developers uh, in average put about 18 hours a month resolving security vulnerabilities. That's a lot. That's like two days of work every month. Uh, invested in um, resolving security vulnerabilities, and we'd like to keep that number uh, smaller to let them, again, focus on uh, developing things that would impact our business. So we need to find a way to focus on the vulnerabilities that impact our systems, to fix only the critical ones that constitute a real risk, uh, and then look at the others, hopefully, in a different time and get better cooperation from the developers as well as uh, focus on what really matters. Paul, this is yours. Thank you. 
Uh, so to talk a little bit about what we've done at Syracon, uh, the company's roots uh, and, a, and a little bit about me, uh, my co-founder and I originally ran a research group out of Arizona State University. And we had received a large grant from the Director of National Intelligence for a program to bring more uh, predictive ability to cybersecurity. My background is in machine learning. And so the idea that we came up with during that program was to predict which software vulnerabilities would be exploited ahead of time, but based on the hacker conversations from places like the deep web, dark web, social media, uh, GitHub, uh, proof of concept availability, pen test module availability. And what you see for the vulnerability shown on the slide, these are some examples of the types of intelligence that we collect and that are ingested into the machine learning algorithm to provide a prediction. So you see some examples here. We've got uh, a little bit of uh, foreign language posting. I think there's a, you know, some GitHub there and so on. Next slide, please. But the threat intelligence, if all we did was provide threat intelligence, that would become unwieldy very quick because now you're doing research on the vulnerabilities and what we found in in talking with customers that doing the analysis and the research on the vulnerabilities is often just as as taxing as the remediation itself i mean you could drive yourself crazy going through old dark web posts and social media trying to figure out what's important what's not the key innovation that we've brought uh, out of that government funded program and, and you know what we have available in our solutions is the ability to not only provide you the intelligence but provide a prediction and we call this the psi rating score so you see here on this graph is an example for uh, the vulnerability uh, shown there how the psi rating score changes over time it could go up or down and the psi rating is interpreted as a relative likelihood and what that means is uh, this vulnerability here has a rel has a psi rating of 38.4, so it's 38.4 times more likely to be exploited than your average vulnerability, because your average vulnerability is only about you know somewhere in the neighborhood of 3% chance of being exploited. So once you have that intelligence, the machine learning algorithm can make a much firmer uh, prediction, and that's what's represented by the psi rating. In the study you're going to see today, you're going to see how the psi rating compares with some common methods of vulnerability prioritization uh, that David and his team have gathered by talking uh, to uh, several large organizations. Yep. So uh, we're going to discuss, um, this is based on, on the same survey that Paolo mentioned, we're going to discuss what are the five uh, most common ways of prioritizing vulnerabilities for remediation. Uh, we're going to touch on uh, the way customers actually prioritize vulnerabilities today. Um, most often, by the way, there's no um, process in place or a, a kind of a, a single way of prioritizing vulnerabilities. Most customers still use manual systems or uh, security analysts who would go and uh, analyze uh, security vulnerabilities one by one. Uh, usually they will be based on those five common practices, but not always they have all the uh, necessary information to make the right decisions. So let's uh, let's talk about those five uh, uh, common uh, uh, ways of uh, prioritizing vulnerabilities. So first of all, uh, and and that's kind of uh, the first thing, and it's easy because you can take this information from the NVD. Um, it's the severity of the vulnerability. You can use uh, CVSS score. By the way, uh, CVSS uh, 3.0 and 3.1. Uh, take that into kind of a better uh, way of forming not just uh, uh, a severity, but also try to understand the impact of uh, those vulnerabilities. But most often you will look at the critical ones that uh, you think would be riskier to your application. 
um, and try to uh, resolve them first. Um, th that's kind of the immediate or the usual suspect when it comes to a uh, way of uh, prioritizing vulnerabilities. Most often uh, you will keep the low and, and medium ones uh, uh, to be handled after the critical ones. And if you look at the, um, you know, um, percentage of the different types of vulnerabilities, so you kind of remove almost 85% of those vulnerabilities if you just focus on the critical ones. Um, if you, um, if you uh, take this information and compare it with the SAR rating information, that's not necessarily uh, how it looks like uh, on the eyes of uh, of hackers or hacker communities. Paolo, may, may, you may want to uh, say a word or two about the correlation between the two. Yeah, I mean, there's a couple things going on in these charts. So first off, you know, with many of the companies we've spoken with, um, you know, they start out by focusing on the highs and criticals. But as you see here, it's well over 50% of vulnerabilities are high and critical anyway. And when you're talking about tens of thousands of vulnerabilities, it's, it's very easy to be overwhelmed just with that. And how do you make decisions amongst the high and criticals? On the other side of the slide here, you see how the psi rating, uh, regardless of of the psi rating, the average CVSS score in each bucket is about the same. And this is something that's been very interesting because we've seen a definite trend in hackers looking to target medium and low scored NIST vulnerabilities for the very reason that uh, they're overlooked by people who are handling that because they think, oh, it's not higher critical, I can go deal with that. And the issue really stems from the fact that the CVSS score is not driven by intelligence. And it wasn't designed to be predictive in the first place. Very good point, thanks. Um, I think this is, if I would start uh, defining uh, my own, I would call it prioritization funnel, I would start with the application type. And, and it's not just you know the type, it's, it's the business criticality of the app. So, most often you would like to uh, prioritize your um, applications that face the internet, the ones that uh, have access to the most important data of your organization, whether personal data, financial data, what have you, uh, because the risk is higher with those applications and uh, a downtime or a data theft from those type of applications would impose the highest risk. So, what we see from customers is that they try to assign some kind of a metric like the business criticality of the application to uh, start and, and filtering them by, let's look at the most critical ones first and then look at the other apps uh, after that. Um, and that's kind of a, a good business, um, um, I would say practice to uh, look at the most important applications first. Uh, because they they are the ones that are most critical to your business. And, and again, um, it doesn't mean that you don't resolve or you don't remediate issues related to less critical apps, um, but you want to uh, get started with those applications. And what we're seeing from time to time is, is that customers try to create some kind of uh, complex uh, risk scores associated with vulnerabilities that are based on more than just one uh, data point. So it could be severity plus application type, and then we'll touch on more points uh, uh, later. Now, this is uh, um, again something that also being uh, looked mostly by security analysts, and, and I'm, I'm, I'll try now to kind of uh, differentiate between the people who analyze and uh, associate risk with vulnerabilities in organizations and the ones who actually resolve those vulnerabilities. So if you look at uh, you know, the security analysts, the AppSec people, the DevSecOps people, they would want to have a system in place that would allow them to uh, prioritize those vulnerabilities in an automated fashion um, and 
somehow uh, send those vulnerabilities or associate them or assign them to developers, developers tend to less care about um, how those vulnerabilities are being prioritized. They just want to get less vulnerabilities uh, and uh, invest less time and less efforts in resolving them. So they also want to uh, um, find the ones that are also have an, a quick way of, of remediation. We'll touch on that. But if you look at the um, at you know at the popularity of vulnerabilities, there's no real um, correlation uh, between um, the popularity of project against the number or the severity of vulnerabilities associated with it. So you would expect you know the uh, the most common projects uh, like Apache Struts or Spring or React to have um, relatively more vulnerabilities than smaller projects. But you know, uh, if if we kind of uh, compare it to the uh, the slide of of the severity of vulnerabilities, those would be the ones that would be patched the faster and would be the most um, uh, that you know the fastest to be. Um, updated by organizations and the, the ones that would be more closely monitored, while um, you know the less common applications may be overlooked and then they could be a kind of a quicker or a, um, an easier target for hackers. So while you would expect that there would be a correlation between the two, um, the truth that matters is that there's no correlation and uh, you need to look at um, popular applications as, as kind of any any other application because uh, hackers and and you know popularity of CVEs is not really correlated to popularity. Um, this is uh, an interesting angle of um, of prioritizing vulnerabilities. So, you know, if I would I would ask you if you have a vulnerability in your system that's been published. 10 months ago or a year ago versus one that was published a month ago, what would you choose first? And, and you know, people will say, okay, I want to, uh, you know, close the ones that have been opened earlier because I have, a, I have a, an attack window that's already very big, but it doesn't mean that um, you really, you're really right with prioritizing those vulnerabilities. So, and it's it's also very hard because the first time you install systems that uh, scan your code or scan your open source components, and you find thousands or tens of thousands of vulnerabilities, it could help you so much uh, with prioritizing them. If you look at the dates, most often you we will see customers uh, deciding on on like a cutoff date, saying like I'm not remediating anything that's uh, longer, you know, that has been published. Uh, um, earlier than you know the last six months because I just can't handle so many vulnerabilities. I want to embrace a process where starting now I will not have anything that's been published in the last six months that has not been remediated. Um, I can still tell you looking at the data on, on our project that uh, if you look at uh, vulnerabilities such as uh, Apache Struts or you know the ones that have been published in 2017 and 2018, but many customers still have those vulnerable versions running in their systems because it's so hard to patch them. But what happens is that they, for new systems, for the new vulnerabilities, they would usually have a process to follow and uh, try to automatically remediate uh, those vulnerabilities. The last point, and this is kind of, uh, you know, looking at the, the results of this survey is that the ease of remediation is usually a very good indicator of whether a, a, you know, a vulnerability is going to be remediated or not. So again, it's, it, it's kind of related to the personas, to the people who actually remediate the vulnerabilities. Those are the developers, and they're looking to uh, um, spend as less time as possible remediating those vulnerabilities either by just you know using a new version of the, the component or making small changes to their code uh definitely the ones that require uh you know 
thorough testing and rewriting of you know your automated uh, automated test scripts and so on uh, they will look at uh, second because they will uh, they will need to invest much more time in those vulnerabilities so uh, if you look i mean just to summarize the whole five points if you look at kind of the combination of the five you will probably find um, some kind of uh, of an 80 percent rule of how customers do that now if you think that there's one um, most common way looking at the results means that it's all over the place there's no like real um, dominator with regards to how organizations actually prioritize uh, detection and remediation of vulnerabilities there's so many different ways and so many different people do it in in those different ways i think that it's related to the maturity of the organizations the maturity of those processes um and more importantly to the personas of the people who do that so as if you have a, a good DevSecOps practice you would probably have an automated way of discovering and remediating vulnerabilities but as we know most organizations are not there yet are not there yet and they're still struggling and they do things based on different types of priorities and one more point is is if you look at this graph asking the same question again the same people may change over time so you know it, it's not that they have a single way of doing that and they stick to it they just it's just a matter of uh the time of the year or the uh you know the the, the maturity level of the organizations so we believe that you know at some point there will be a structured process in organizations when automated systems will um, fit into those processes and and that's how actually organizations are going to do that in the future and then there's going to be an kind of a, an automated prioritization funnel so with that let's uh talk about uh, two new approaches that are not actually mentioned in the survey and, and could be very insightful for uh, uh organizations to actually use uh, and reduce risk uh, with some new ways of, of uh, detecting and remediating vulnerabilities. Paolo. Yeah, so first what uh, was found in the study was that uh, there were about four CWEs. And for those of you maybe not familiar, CWE is a standard for common weaknesses in software. And each software vulnerability is associated with, uh, with a common weakness. So when you start now categorizing vulnerabilities by common weakness, uh, there's a much clearer uh, correlation. And we've identified uh, top four weaknesses that were uh, typically used by hackers. Now, the reason why this correlation occurs makes a lot of sense because hackers tend to focus on exploit techniques that they are experts in. So uh, if you go to the next slide, please. So if you see, you know, some of these ones toward the top, things like, say, cross-site scripting, um, you know, hackers that have specialized and developed their uh, set of skills around that, they became quite good. And so they sort of stick with what's, what's good and what they know. Um, it's also uh, interesting to see that the top vulnerabilities here are dealing with things that, um, are actually, in my opinion, a little bit easier uh, to exploit things dealing with uh, the inputs. Um, so now by crafting, say, um, you know, improper input that causes the software to crash and allows me maybe to execute a little bit of code, that is easy to implement. It's also easy to share. And what we have seen distributed in the hacker communities, uh, snippets of code, uh, POCs and so on that allow these things to become more prolific. Now, when you start getting into the weaknesses outside of there, uh, it becomes much more even across the board as to what's being used and what's not. So, so this is, of course, a, a telling result. Um, I think in some ways a little bit uh, not so surprising because, you know, we kind of have ideas about how hackers work. And I think if you talk to your own security team, they might, you know, if they were going to do a hack, they would probably start with things like buffer overflow and 
cross-site scripting that are relatively easy uh, to do uh, going forward. We also note that um, there also is a little bit disproportionate number of vulnerabilities in some of these categories as well. So again, you also have to consider how, once I start looking at these buckets, how do I then prioritize vulnerabilities within these large weakness categories? Next slide, please. So this is um, kind of a novel way of uh, actually looking at vulnerabilities from the uh, angle of effectiveness. So what, are, what is uh, an effective vulnerability? Let's start with uh, just understanding what it means. And this is, by the way, um, one of the most effective ways of reducing a lot of the uh, false positives that cannot be detected uh, in any other way. So let's say I have um, a CVE attached to my application, the way I use it, um, because I use a, a vulnerable component. Um, most chances, uh, and this is based on, on real data from hundreds of customers and tens of thousands of projects, is that the way that I utilize uh, this component is actually not really vulnerable. So the key question is, do, does my app really call the vulnerable lines of code or the vulnerable methods or not? And, and I'm talking about today, the way this, the, my app is written now. So if I analyze, if I if I analyze the code and I understand all the execution paths from my code to the vulnerable um, method or lines of code, and I can see that for sure there's no way the vulnerable code is going to be executed, then yes, um, I need to remediate this vulnerability, but no, I don't have to do anything immediately. And if my system is constantly monitoring it, then Let's let me focus on the ones that I know that, uh, as, as you know, Paolo mentioned on, on the previous slide, are really uh, exploitable because there's uh, ex exploits out there, but are also reachable by the code. So uh, a combination of these two elements, uh, which probably reduces the the number of uh, vulnerabilities by 90 something percent, uh, will probably reduce a lot of the noise and will allow the security teams to focus on the ones that actually constitute a risk and we we'll let them escalate those vulnerabilities to uh, the development teams um, with a, a much smaller number than the thousands or tens of thousands. And when, when we're running the system for the first time and we're seeing those uh, thousands of vulnerabilities and after uh, you know being able to analyze the ones that are actually effective and re reducing that number to 80 or 60, that's becoming a manageable number that people can actually prioritize, can actually look into, can actually analyze and remediate. So I think that combining those two methods together uh, will actually constitute a new, very effective way of prioritizing uh, security vulnerabilities in your code. So again, um, I think that um, you cannot remediate, you cannot always uh, be 100% safe, but you need to know um, where are your risks are and how you can reduce them to a minimum uh, so you can protect your most important systems. And prioritization is, is a key to achieve that. Paolo, any closing words? Yeah. You know, just with the firms uh, that we've worked with, you know, moving to um, approaches where you're reducing false positives, driving prioritization of your remediation efforts based on intelligence and the threat behavior. Um, what it does is now it's positioning your remediation efforts to be directly counter to the adversary and focused on what's relevant. And it reduces risk by doing it this way while at the same time increasing efficiency. And I think that's really what you know many people are after. Great, thank you. I think that we're now ready to take some questions. 
Excellent. Well, we have gotten some great questions in so far. I'm really excited about these questions. So let's, uh, I do want to remind the audience real quick that we do have plenty of time for questions. So if you have one, go ahead and use the GoToWebinar control panel and submit your questions. And we'll try to get to as many as we can. Here is the first one. Let's see. Develop okay, developers don't think using new versions of a library to remediate is easy. So what are your thoughts on that? Uh, that's a very good question. Developers are uh, reluctant to use the latest version of the library because they're afraid that uh, their application would break, that uh, it's not going to be backward compatible. But the truth of the matter is, is that if they follow this um, guideline for a long time, there will be many versions behind, and I can assure you that their application is going to break. So actually, the best practice is to try to be on the latest version as much as you can, even if it doesn't resolve any security vulnerability, because 89% of um, those security vulnerabilities are published together with a fixed version. So if you're on, you know, if you want to be on the preventative side of, of reducing risk, try to be on the latest version. I know it's hard, but if you, if you, have, um, you know, kind of um, follow those processes and, and keep in shape with the latest version of uh, those components, you're reducing your risk by 90% just by being, just by doing that. So I know it's hard. I know it's a change of, of mindset. But that's the best way today to uh, to do that. Uh, I have a, a comment on that one as well. Uh, with the customers we deal with, uh, they many of them run into this you know same problem not only with uh, libraries but with underlying platforms that things are running on top of, and it is hard because a simple version upgrade can cause all kinds of dependencies to break, and that even cascades, and that leads to a lot of work. So, you know, kind of the, the thing that a lot of our clients had come to the conclusion is that we need to make those decisions in a risk-based way. I have to understand how much work is involved. That's the job of the developer and, you know, sometimes the patch management team. But I also have to understand how much risk am I accepting by not doing this? So is there an exploit for the vulnerability or do we anticipate one? Is the vulnerability, can it be realized? Is it effective, as David was talking about? If it's effective and it's looking like it's going to be targeted, then maybe going to management and asking for more resources and making that case with the intelligence might be the best thing to do because now you're putting the, you're communicating the risk to management in that resource request and they have a clear understanding of the consequences that decision's not made. All right, great. Uh, next question here. How do CWEs correlate to the OWASP 10, top 10 web application security risks? Oh, well, I think this is yours. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, um, you know, so there there is some correlation there, mainly because OWASP is is sort of designed to hit the things that are of broadest impact, and OWASP is looking at what is commonly exploited and what hackers are writing. And when you look at the intelligence, yeah, they're focused on things like cross-site scripting vulnerabilities and buffer overflow again because those are easy. OWASP is trying to put out that top 10 to increase security of a broad population by the greatest extent possible. Um, we would caution though that that could not be considered the be all and end all. Hackers are exploiting things outside of those top CWEs. Um, and that's actually where a lot of uh, the intelligence focus and understanding you know, how that vulnerability is being leveraged comes into play. Okay, great. Quick reminder to the audience, there's plenty of time for questions. So go ahead and use the GoToWebinar control panel if you do have a question for either Paolo or David. Uh, next question here, uh, and uh, this one is for you, Paolo. What does an automated prioritization process look like 
when you talk about maturity and structure of an organization in your view? So, you know, in terms of looking at uh, the vulnerabilities uh, in this process and, you know, your development process, you have to think, you know, uh, real maturity, you should actually be considering the vulnerabilities when you're making the decision to use software in the underlying platform or a code library, because that's the best place to start taking action. So if you are designing a platform, designing an image, designing a piece of software, and you have like tentative decisions on what you're going to use, you can research those libraries. So for example, I'm going to use a library that might cause me to use a deprecated uh, underlying platform. I can then see, okay, what kind of risk am I accepting with that underlying platform? Or if I'm relying on a, a certain image uh, to build something because it makes my life easier, what are the vulnerabilities in that image and what is the threat to those vulnerabilities? So that's like really the best place to start doing that. However, of course, the threat evolves and the exposed vulnerabilities evolve. So that's why it's important that as code is rolled out, as new code is deployed going outside the development process, as well as if you're using containers, as those containers are spun up, uh, what are the vulnerabilities right prior to deployment? Now we can start looking at more dynamic decisions uh, based on you know, things like intelligence, where maybe if there's an active exploit, when that image spins up, maybe we stop it right there because it's too dangerous to run. And these are the kind of activities we see in high maturity organizations. All right, great. Uh, next question, this is an interesting one. How can a software product provider convince their customers to accept the prioritization strategies? Uh, I'll take it and probably Paolo will have some uh, something to complement here. Um, I just think that you can't do otherwise. I mean, you can't resolve all vulnerabilities. You have to have some kind of prioritization process in place. Otherwise, you will not be focusing on what really matters and you will not be reducing risk. Or you would have to employ um, an army of security analysts and developers just for remediating those security vulnerabilities. So I think that by showing them how other customers are doing that effectively um, and being able to reduce risk by employing these um, new ways of uh, prioritization, um, they will be uh, convinced that this is achievable and this is something that any organization can strive to. Even if they're not in a high maturity stage, they can start getting there. And uh, to, to build on that a little, we have a, a client that has a SaaS-based platform and that firm has requirements with some government customers to demonstrate a certain level of security maturity. And the way they use intelligence to communicate that with regard to vulnerability prioritization is show their client uh, you know, the ultimate end client of their software, what they've been doing to remediate the vulnerabilities that are being most threatened today, the things where there's active exploits, the things that are all over the place in the Russian hacking forums. You know, now they can show the evidence. They say, hey, here is what the bad guys are talking about, and this is the action we've taken. And uh, that firm has found that that was an effective way to make that case. Excellent. Okay. Uh, moving along here. Um, let's see. Okay. It makes sense to prioritize by the effectiveness of the vulnerability. The question is how to clearly uh, slash automate, how to clearly automate the identification if my code is using that part of vulnerable code in open and closed source code. Yeah. Um, so you need to have an automated tool in place. This is something that traditionally you could do for only very few uh, vulnerabilities, um, you know, working uh, with security analysts and development teams to try to do that this process manually. And first of all, it, it's just not accurate. And second, it's not scalable. So you have to have uh, automated tools that scan your code continuously 
um, and are also aware of any new vulnerability that comes up and its impact on the way uh, your application is using the uh, the open source components from the closed source component, um, and define policies and processes based on the uh, on those findings. So if you want to alert, if you want to remediate on that, but definitely without automation, this is kind of a, a lost game. So uh, you have to have those uh, tools in place. All so right, that's how great. most of our customers mm -hmm. are actually doing that. So uh, uh, successfully, thanks. All right, great. Uh, next question. Um, this is inter interesting. It feels like it is a snake eating its own tail, meaning if we start prioritizing low medium score vulnerabilities, the hacker community would start prioritizing high critical. What is your input on the subject and how can we be smarter? So that's actually kind of, you know, uh, why our, our firm exists, because I can give you advice on say, hey, look at low and medium NIST vulnerabilities as well. Um, now, I didn't say hackers are exclusively exploiting those. I say they're exploiting those at the same rate as the high and critical. So if you take my advice on the surface, now you're patching everything. And so that's making things worse. But if you're taking an intelligence focused approach toward uh, vulnerability prioritization and looking at what the hackers are talking about, what is actively being exploited, it reduces uh, the amount across the board and it focuses your efforts on what they're actually doing. So what we showed today shows you some things that kind of a coarse granularity to really get to that fine granularity, you need that intelligence support. Um, the solutions that we provide enable customers to stay on top of the most current hacker conversations and where those trends are going and that's, you know, that's uh, how our customers leverage our solutions. Excellent, okay. Uh, quick time check. We are about 18 minutes to the top of the hour, but there's plenty of time for questions. So if you do have a question, please go ahead and use your GoToWebinar control panel and get it on in and we'll uh, hopefully get to it. Next question here, how do you use dark web to report the vulnerabilities that the hackers are targeting or are about to target? Also, one can find customers' critical information that is leaked on the dark web. How can you identify and use that in prioritization? So uh, that's a really interesting question. Uh, I'll cover it in two parts. So the first part about how dark web information is used. So dark web information is used in addition to information from the deep web, social media, telegram, uh, even open internet and security sites. And we mine all that information. And what our platform does is it organizes that information by vulnerability. And for that information dossier for each vulnerability is then what's ingested into the machine learning algorithm to make predictions. And the machine learning algorithm is trained against uh, records of actual exploits in the wild. So the prediction you're getting is the likelihood of an exploit being used in the wild. So that's, you know, in a, a very quick way how it works. Now to go on to the second piece, now you're talking about leaked data and then how, how that can impact things. Well, we're actually looking at two different uses of intelligence. The, the use I described is more really early on. It's kind of left of the whole kill chain where now we're looking at the development of the cyber weaponry. How can we get ahead of the hackers before they're even writing the exploit or deploy it map in a, in a large scale? And that's really the place you wanna be because if you are uh, getting rid of the vulnerabilities that are going to be exploited before the exploit actually occurs, you, know, you have no, uh, you know, no post attack action because there's no attack. Looking at breach data, that's indicating an attack has already occurred. And the way I would use that, if you know that there's been leaked data, then that should be a sign that maybe, okay, where are the vulnerabilities that led to that? Um, where was the sus suspicious activity in the network? And where were there correlations between suspicious activity on servers hosting vulnerable applications? And that intersection between the vulnerable applications and the suspicious activity is probably a great place to start and looking, hey, were there threatened vulnerabilities there we weren't taking care of? 
then sort of you know backtrack from there in your investigation. But really, we're looking at two different actions. Uh, what David and I are trying to encourage people to do on this webinar is you know, be more to the left, be more proactive and kind of avoid this stuff altogether. Excellent. All right, great. The next question here, uh, what is the best way of automatically checking code for vulnerabilities when the development team is very small, e.g. four developers, and managing the testing process takes a large amount of resource compared to the creative part of the team? Um, the idea is to integrate it into the normal day-to-day -day environment of those developers. Uh, could be in their IDE, in their repository. So check every commit, every pull request, report on the uh, vulnerability findings, try to remediate automatically as much as you can um, to save the time of manually analyzing and manually remediating those vulnerabilities. So if you integrate that uh, as seamlessly as possible into the dev environment, uh, and that's there's plenty of tools that, that can do that, including our own, uh, you'll be able to uh, just in time detect those vulnerabilities, uh, prioritize them and remediate them in line. And that's the key. I mean, even if you have four developers and you don't want to invest a lot of time in, uh, you know, code testing or you know uh, um, application security testing and code analysis just run it as part of your pipeline and and we too also integrate with git and allow that you know streamlined aspect as part of the pipeline to avoid creating additional overhead all right all right, great. So uh, we're plugging right along here with these questions. The next one, uh, the 2000 prioritization, uh, sorry, 2019 prioritization of vulnerability looks similar to the OWASP top 10. Is it a different methodology and can you provide more information on this? Um, I assume that we're talking about this slide. Um, If I get it right, then this is uh, based on a survey um, we've done with more than 600 developers in large organizations, trying to understand if there's um, one um, predominant way of prioritizing vulnerabilities. Um, some of it, yes, aligns with OWASP uh, top 10, but uh, the idea here was that we couldn't find any um, kind of clear or true leader in the way that those organizations prioritize uh, vulnerability detection and remediation. Um, so I hope I got the question right, but some of it aligns with OWASP top 10, um, but, um, and naturally um, I, I believe those people who answered it are aware of the OWASP top 10 framework and uh, you know, running with uh, known vulnerabilities like uh, uh, OWASP uh, number nine and so on is is a kind of reflected here. Um, but there's no uh, clear translation between these results and OWASP top 10, nor there is, I mean, even in OWASP top 10, you know, number one is kind of the first thing you want to look at. And here there's kind of very similar uh, uh, ratios between the various items. All right. Okay, great. Um, so we're about 12 minutes to the top of the hour. I think we have time for maybe three or four more questions. Uh, here's one. Uh, machine learning depends on clean data. When a bunch of hackers are trying to develop tools to do something, you just try and trial and error. The data set is not that clean. How do you predict anything with accuracy with noisy information? Oh, that's a that's an excellent question. Um, you know, it's, there's a couple keys here. So first off is it's important to have multiple sources of data, uh, the data that indicates that an exploit could occur. Because when when you see small amount of signal, hack, you know, hackers are talking about, is there an exploit for this vulnerability? Um, I'm interested in an exploit for this vulnerability. I'm looking to buy an exploit for this vulnerability. Uh, that is only one piece of the puzzle. 
if you see other hackers actually release code, maybe it's not code that can be weaponized yet, but that's just another piece of the puzzle right there. Uh, the key really is having many different sources where the sources have sort of an intervalidation among them uh, to do the prediction. And then the second piece of this is we use what's called a supervised machine learning model. I alluded to it earlier, which means the model is not only considering these types of indicator data that I described, but also is trained against actual exploits in the wild. And the beauty of a supervised model is you can actually retrain it and make the model better. You can also test the model in adversarial cases by uh, putting false test data in the model to make sure it's robust. At Syracon, these are the kind of things that we had researched, uh, starting with our government-funded project, and also built processes around where we can ensure model accuracy and ensure robustness against any kind of false data through both our own testing and having a variety of sources. All right, great. Um, let's see, here's, here's a good one for you. I'm using open source tools and images deployed using Kubernetes. Does Syrcon also provide such vulnerability information on the operating systems and for that matter, Kubernetes and Docker? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, we limited the scope of this study to open source vulnerabilities just for uh, the purposes of what we're presenting today. But Syracon collects vulnerability information across the entire spectrum of software uh, to include the operating system as well as things like Docker and Kubernetes itself. And so especially when you start looking at a holistic approach, you know, okay, I've got the application uh, button down and that's normally falls within the realm of DevSecOps. When you start looking at things like, you know, Kubernetes security, am I on the newest version of Kubernetes? Is that itself posing a big risk? Um, you're starting to straddle, depending on the organization and the world between DevSecOps and the CISO's Vol Management Group. Uh, but Syracon, we collect intelligence across the board, so we support that use case as well. Okay, great. Excellent. Okay, next one here. Um, does, uh, let's see, does CVS 3.1, CVSS 3.1 help the prioritizing vulnerabilities help in prioritizing vulnerabilities i think that um the addition of trying to quantify uh the impact on on the system is the one thing that differentiates cvss 3.1 from cvss 3 that's a, a that's a good uh, um addition to cvss 3 and that's a step in the right direction um, and it helps understanding not just not just by looking at the uh, CVSS score itself, but also at the various uh, attack vectors and metrics associated with CVSS3 to prioritize um, um, not just by the score itself. However, I do think that you need to attach more data points like the uh, business criticality of the app, effectiveness, uh, and so on to be able to prioritize a vulnerability and look a, in a holistic manner at uh, prioritization. All right, all right, great. So we're about uh, eight, seven minutes to the top of the hour. I think we have time for two more questions, then we'll go ahead and close it out. Next question, how can SireCon predictions be integrated into my CICD pipeline? So like I, I mentioned earlier, you know, we have a couple different uh, SDKs available for both Git and Python, um, also web user interface. So if you take a list of vulnerabilities that could be dragged and dropped into the web user interface and uh, based on the results, the SI rating score, as well as metadata such as availability of exploit, availability of a pen test module, decisions can be made and things can be even further automated. So maybe I want to uh, automatically generate a report to, uh, you know, to justify a delay in development due to recent exploits being seen. Uh, you can do that. Or like I mentioned before, if you want to actually go to an extreme measure and actually block deployment of code based on some of these factors, you could do that too. Um, and further, you know, looking at other solutions like uh, 
dealing with things like vulnerability effectiveness, you know, you can easily develop logic that can integrate both that as well as the intelligence. Excellent. Okay. All right, let's go ahead and dive into our last question here, then we'll close it out for the question and answer period. Uh, what is the best preventative measure to take to reduce open source vulnerabilities risk? I think that this is kind of uh, a similar answer to the question about uh, how hard it is to uh, keep up to date with your open source dependencies. Mm -hmm. So the best preventative um, measure you can take is to try to be on the latest version of open source components. You know, I know that it's hard, but it will automatically um, reduce your risk by almost 90%. Uh, try to have these processes in place where it's easy for you to uh, keep your dependencies up to date. There's many ways of automating that and uh, generating update pull requests for every new version that comes up. Uh, you can also run automated tests in, in, in this manner. Um, and try to prioritize your vulnerabilities in such a way that you will only focus on the ones that matter. Combine those two. Um, um, processes together and you'll have uh, an efficient way of uh, of being preventative. All right, great. Well, we are four minutes to the top of the hour, so I'm gonna go ahead and close out the question and answer period. If we didn't get to your question, I apologize. I think we got to all of them, but uh, if we didn't, um, please know that the folks at White Source will be getting a copy of all the questions that came in and I'm sure somebody from their organizations will be more than happy to follow up with you offline and get your question answered. I also want to remind the audience that today's event has been recorded. So if you missed any or all of the event, you will have the opportunity to access it later on. Following today's webinar, we are going to be sending out an email that contain, contains a link to access the webinar on demand. And the webinar is also going to be living on the devops.com website. So you can always go look for it there. Just go to devops.com slash webinars, look in the on-demand section, and it should be right there waiting for you. Okay, I did mention at the top of the hour that we would be doing a drawing for six $25 Amazon gift cards. So without further ado, let's go ahead and do that real quick. Our winners today are Andrea K. Congratulations, Andrea. Chris J, congratulations, Chris. Uh, Charles C, congratulations, Charles. Deborah B, congratulations, Deborah. Jason K, congratulations, Jason. And our final winner today is John S. Congratulations, John. We'll be following up with all of you offline by email to uh, to get your gift card over to you. So please check your inbox. If you don't see it in your inbox, then please check your spam folder. All right, uh, David, Paolo, thank you so much for such a great presentation. Lots of great information. And judging from the number of questions we got, I know the audience got a lot out of it too. So thanks a lot for your time and your expertise. Really do appreciate it. Thank you, sir. All right. Also want to thank the audience for joining me today. This is Charlene O'Hanlon and I'm signing off. Have a great day, everybody. Please stay safe.